Hey guys, Peter here. Welcome to another episode of Peter Chats. Today I'm going to be talking about my experience in investment banking. I started investment banking at UBS in the summer of 2008, in the beginning of the great financial crisis. Now, I was only there for a year as an analyst. It was a very interesting year because it was during one of the most tumultuous times in recent financial history. Now, out of an incoming class of about 100 analyst, I'd say 90% analysts actually leave by the end of two years. So my one year time period is actually not that short. And of the 10 perhaps that remain past two years, most of them leave by the end of three years. Why is that? Well, banking is mainly structured to be a two year program. You work very long hours. And most of the analysts are not expected to stay past two years. For example, Monday through Friday, I probably work from 10 in the morning to about midnight or even past that. On Saturdays, I come in for another eight to 10 hours of work. And then on Sundays, I'd be in for another six to eight hours. So on average, I worked about 70 to 80 hours a week. Obviously, you can't keep that up for a long time. But after one or two years, most people get very burnt out. Even though I only worked there for one year, the long hours made it seem like I worked there for two or three years. When I think about the hours I worked, I think I probably made like $25 an hour. What is investment banking? Investment banking is actually a misnomer. There's no investing or banking really involved. Now an investment bank has three divisions, sales and trading, equity research, and investment banking. When most people talk about investment bank or investment banking, they're usually talking about the investment banking specific division. They're not really talking about sales and trading or equity research. I don't know a lot about sales and trading. I did interact a lot with the equity research side of banks when I went to the investing side. Now investment banking is all about serving clients. Investment banks help companies do a couple of things. They help companies raise debt or equity. And then secondly, they help companies either buy other businesses and companies or they help companies sell businesses or sell themselves to other companies. And that's basically it. So investment banking is about selling your service and then helping clients run a process. So at the end of that process, you can collect the big commission fee. What do analysts do? There's a hierarchy. The managing director or MD is a top investment banker. That person is responsible for building relationships with companies, mainly CFOs and treasurers, and trying to win mandates or win deals. And the MD is trying to sell his service to that company. So if the company wants to raise capital, either debt or equity, or if they want to do any transaction in buying or selling companies, MD says, I want to be the person to do that for you. For that reason, investment banking is sometimes referred to as the sell side. Everyone below the MD is helping the MD to pitch for new business or run the process once the MD has won a business. Now the analyst at the very bottom of the totem pole. Most of my time was spent making pitch decks. These are big PowerPoint presentations that the MD would take to prospective client meeting. Most of the pages in the pitch deck were boilerplate pages that are pulled from older pitch decks. And a lot of my time was spent updating these pages. Now on these pages were things like financial metrics and graphs that needed to be updated, as well as company profiles that needed to be made. Now these company profiles were companies that we were suggesting to a client to potentially buy. Sometimes I'd have to build financial models and the summary of those models that have to put into the pitch deck. Now what people don't commonly talk about is that in the investment banking job there's actually two departments that do a, that help the analysts do a lot of the work. One is the India team or an outsourced team in India and the other is the presentations team. Now a lot of the pitch deck pages have standardized work and to speed things up we actually send a lot of that work out to our India team and then in order to make the presentations aesthetically pleasing we have a huge presentations team to make sure that all the formats and the graphs and they look pretty. So a lot of my time was actually spent managing the work that I sent out to these two teams. So when I get work back from them, I have to check them, make sure that there weren't any mistakes, or make minor edits myself. And then I would deliver the book to my associate so he can review them before it went to the MD. Now most of my days, even though I'm there in the office by 10, I'm actually sitting around for several hours in the morning. And that's because we're waiting for the MD to review the book to get his comments. And because of his schedule, we don't know when that'll get done. But most of the time we get his comments back by midday. So the analyst is usually there from midday until late at night to get the work done before he gives it back to the associate for review who then gives it back to the MD. I found the job more physically demanding than intellectually demanding. It was mostly relatively low level mundane administrative work and it was just lots of it. It had to get done at random hours of the night. Why did I do it? I was studying engineering and finance in college and I was finding that I enjoyed my finance classes a lot more than my engineering classes. I had no idea what career I was going to pursue after college. I had a roommate who was really into business and he dragged me along to some presentations held by companies that would visit our campus. And he told me, you know, my goal was to get an investment banking internship. And I thought, if that's his goal, I guess I should make that my goal. It seemed like he knew what he was talking about and I figured, well, I couldn't get too off track by following him. So basically I followed the crowd. I wasn't really thinking for myself. So why did I go back? to a full-time job after the internship. I reluctantly went back because I really didn't know what else to do with my life. I thought I'd do it for a year or two and then figure out what to do next. I was just told that it was a good thing to do as your first job because you learn a lot and it sets you up for better opportunities in the future. I remember speaking to an analyst 
who was at the bank when I was an intern, and I asked him what his future plans were. He said that he wanted to do two years of banking, and then he would do two years of private equity, followed by getting an MBA. And then I asked him, well, what would you do after the MBA? He says, I don't know. I need to figure out what I want to do in my life after that. I always thought that was kind of strange that he would commit six years of his life to doing something that may not necessarily be what he really wanted to do. But I think it's because we're, we're told by so many people that this is something that we should do, that it's good for us, that we end up just doing it. What did I learn? I learned how to build a financial model. I learned how to be really fast at Excel and PowerPoint. I learned how to get a lot of work done really quickly. And I learned how to pay attention to details. I would have to go through these 100 page decks and check for any formatting issues or typo issues. So naturally over time, I got really good at finding small little details that needed to be fixed. I think the biggest negative is that you develop this sense of like rushed anxiety. Like you never have enough time to get the work done. You're always scrambling to make edits. You're always scrambling to print the final books. And so there's a perpetual sense of like rushed, rushed, rushed. And I think I carry that, that anxiety of just feeling rushed all the time into my next job. And it probably took me a good three, four months to wean off of that rushed kind of feeling inside before I realized that I didn't need to rush to do this work and that and nothing was due the next like hour or the next like day. Why did I leave? Most analysts are supposed to leave after two years. It's kind of an unwritten agreement that you do a two-year program and the MDs would you know, write nice letters of recommendation or introduce you to private equity friends they have so you can then go get a private equity job. I think I quickly realized that I did not want to be an MD. They were effectively selling their time and their service. I realized that I wanted to create value through making decisions and I didn't want to create value by providing service or at least selling my time. I saw the physical toll that it took on people. I remember one of the, the mid-level bankers because he was 30, but I just recall him looking much more older than 30. I just thought that I, I didn't want to potentially take that physical toll on my own body. The culture was somewhat threat-like. You know, there was a lot of uh, cursing and, and name-calling, all in good fun, but there's certainly a lot of cynicism in the culture. And as years went by and I reflected on, on why that was and if banking could ever be, be better, you know, as, as a job for people, I realized that it was just, it's too challenging because the nature of the work I and mean, when you're serving clients in this capacity, it's just very sporadic, it's tense. There's a lot of work to get done. I just think the way the work is structured, it just makes people become different. It makes them more cynical, unfortunately. And we worked with some lawyers and I felt like they were even working harder than us. We would send maybe drafts or revisions of work at midnight or one and then I would wake up the next morning and see emails from them at two, three or four o'clock in the morning. So I think the nature of the work just makes it very tough to have a, a lighthearted culture. And unfortunately, I think a lot of that cynicism is just tied to just the work itself. I know I like business. I read a lot of investing books. And I realized that that's what actually interested me. And when I got an opportunity to do investing, I basically said this was the time for me to leave. So that's why I left after one year. How did you cope with the long hours? I think mentally most people are prepared going in that they're going to have no life. And so they say to themselves, well, for the next year or two, I'm okay without having a life because I'm making an investment in my future. And I think they just hope that it works out somehow that they can survive, you know, some really grueling weeks where you may be working 100 or 120 hours a week. And I think you also learn that you are tougher than you are, that you can't actually work really long hours. But at the same time, it does take a toll on you. And there are some associates with young families that I knew they couldn't see their families on the weekdays. Now, associates were usually MBA students that came from non-finance backgrounds. Maybe they wanted a change in their career. They went to get an MBA and they went into banking thinking that it was a great, successful, lucrative career that they could embark on. Unfortunately, I think the quit rate or the churn rate for associates was actually pretty high. Looking back, I know a lot of the associates that I work with are no longer in banking. They've actually left the industry. I think because we were there for so long, we just had to find a way to entertain each other. We would, you know, find maybe small games to play. We would come up with nicknames and jokes. Uh, we would abuse use you know seamless web and i know a lot of the, the folks who go out and, and drink pretty hard on friday and saturday nights and they will wake up on saturdays and roll into the office around noon time to uh to start working again would i do it over again and would i recommend someone to do it out of college i think that's a tough question because if you don't feel like you have anything else to do and this is a reasonably good opportunity presented to you it's probably unlikely that you would not take it at least you'll learn something you know, it'll look good on your resume and so you know would i do it again i think at that time i, I just was not very mature and did not know what what was what in the world so it was probably helpful for me to just get that experience at least for a year and i probably wouldn't be where i am today if i didn't do it you can't turn back the hand of time and go back and all of 
milestone and become a more mature person and find some other job to do. Now, would I recommend someone else doing it today? I think that the cachet of being an analyst in banking has has diminished quite a bit. I think there are a lot more opportunities in other industries. So I think if someone today is driven enough, intelligent enough to get a job in banking, they'll probably get a better job in a different industry where it's not as grueling of work and they can probably learn more business related skills. Hopefully this was an entertaining chat. I know that my experience was very unique, so I can't speak to every person's banking experience. It was during the depth of the crisis. A lot of the deals that we did were around debt restructuring, getting you know debt covenants restructured. So it wasn't super exciting. I think the bulk of the work in terms of like pitching for new business is pretty consistent across all analysts. If you have any questions or feedback, please leave me a comment. I'll do my best to respond to it. Please subscribe. Thank you guys. Take care. Bye-bye.